Iano has been in Frederick County 22 years and is currently a resident of Iamsville. Thank you, Colleen, for being here. Uh, Dr. Zakir Bengali has been in the county for 37 years and currently re resides in Adamstown. Tony Schmelick has been in Frederick County 40 years and currently resides in Iamsville. Joy Schaefer has been in the county for 11 years and currently resides in Spring Ridge area of Frederick. And then Katie Grove has been a county resident for 45 years and currently lives in Frederick. And Katie informed me that she doesn't have a, uh, a, a website, but go to Facebook to find Katie, okay? All right, terrific. So we're going to go ahead and get started. <coughs> STEM is a national initiative designed to attract strong talent for high-tech jobs by offering work visas to immigrants so the U.S. remains competitive in a global marketplace. According to research, men outnumber women 73% to 27% overall in all sectors of employment for science and engineering. Please share with us your strategy for how women, young and old, can be encouraged to pursue careers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. How can women be more competitive and achieve higher paying roles in those fields instead of reaching to other countries to fill those important positions? We'll start with Dr. Bengali. Well, first I want to thank the Commission for Women for inviting us for this and arranging this forum. So, uh, there are many aspects to the strategy for involving women in these areas of science, technology, math, and engineering so they can get high paying jobs. But I'll focus only on one which has worked for us. Our daughter Heather, who graduated from Frederick High School, is uh, trained as a hardware engineer. When she was in the seventh grade, American Association for University of Women arranged a career fair where these young ladies got to meet uh, women who were in high career positions. And Heather met two women who impressed her very much. One was a mathematician from NASA, and one was the <coughs> division director at NIST, who was a physicist. Before her completed her high school, Heather spent a whole day at NIST with this lady. And this really encouraged her and inspired her and she went to Penn State's honors program and got a degree in computer, si uh, computer engineering and, and was employed as a hardware engineer uh, in one of the major computer companies. So the most important strategy is to provide these young ladies with role models uh, so that they can have faith in that not only they can pursue, but how far they can go. And I think the school board along with other organizations like Chamber of Commerce, PTAs, should organize such fairs where the, in the middle school, these young ladies can go meet uh, uh, women in profession and find out what those professions entail. My hero from my childhood was Marie Curie. And every time I see women not pursuing, I said, how many Marie Curies are we are losing? So that's my major strategy. Other, of course, is the parental encouragement, uh, school counselors giving more information to women uh, about these kind of careers, and the so society as a whole respecting women in such positions so that there is equal pay for equal work. Okay. Evidently, we've gone past, so I think we gave you a little couple seconds extra there, Dr. Bengali, but thank you for sharing. Okay, so clearly I'm going to need a more of a slide over here, too. That's okay. That's okay. Not a problem. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent. Next person to answer will be Colleen Cusimano. Thank you. Do you want me to repeat the question? No. Okay, I, good. Very good. I, I will say I work in technology and I am very passionate about our STEM education opportunities for our children. When I went to high school, I went to school in Prince George's County and we there was a magnet technology school, Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I did not go to Eleanor Roosevelt, but I went to a neighboring school that benefited from the sort of bleed over about the excitement of technology and the curriculum opportunities. 
there were an extraordinary number of girls in my school that graduated and went on to science-based majors in college, and I was among them. I think we need to have more opportunities for technology and science education for all of our students. We do need to encourage all of our students to enroll. I know when I was taking programming classes in high school, I was the only girl in the class very often. And I look today and we have, in the single digits, girls representing in the classroom. I do think it's important that we talk to our young ladies about their education, that we make technology and science classes exciting, but also that we address a perfectionism. I had a number of my friends who were starting out in science-based majors in college, and while many of our male counterparts would be perfectly happy passing a difficult class with a B or C average, um, many of my female counterparts felt that they had failed if they had gotten anything less than an A. And that's something that we really do need to work on collectively. I have a daughter myself who's very interested in science. It is what she's planning to attain. And it's something that I talk to with her, talk about with her often. Um, I will say that I think that we also need to allow more <coughs> bottom-up types of programs. We've had some very exciting educational opportunities for our children here in Frederick County um, with teachers founding them. So. Um, I would like to make sure that we have good educational and technology resources for our children through and through our schools. Studies have shown that they're more beneficial at the high school and secondary level than at the elementary level. And I've seen our technology focus often be this one-to-one -one computing in kindergarten, which can be exciting, but I don't know long-term that it's that beneficial. But thank, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Mr. Schmeller. I'd also like to thank the the Women's Committee for having this forum. Um, in a lot of ways, I've noticed can't, Board of Education candidates agree on a lot of issues. Uh, and one of the things that Dr. Bengali says was about um, role models, and I think that's very important. Uh, one of the other things that we need to do, though, is give them an opportunity. Uh, recently, in Frederick County, there was a charter school that applied that was supposed to be an all-girls school called EACH. And it was turned down in the county. Uh, because they couldn't decide whether or not it was going to be discriminating or not. When in fact there are other single-sex public schools in the state. I think it would be a great way here that we can achieve something locally by having an all-girls school that would absolutely just um, be used to um, tend to their needs and wants. So that would be one way to do that. But also we need to find a way to invest more in our own technologies. We need to increase uh, the, the technology we have here available to the young ladies in the school systems. And so another uh, thing that we could look to do also would be to hire folks that are role models, not that you would just meet at a, a career fair or something like that, but folks that have been in the workforce. We need to have an easier avenue for them to become teachers here in Frederick County. So often they're told, you know, a professional comes in and wants to be a teacher, they have to go backwards and jump through hoops as if they were starting their career all over again. And I think we need to make that easier to bring uh, professionals into the school systems, especially uh, ladies that can encourage other young women to, pers to pursue uh, in, in the fields of science and engineering and technology. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Joy Schaefer. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I, I definitely agree. The first thing I wrote down when I got this question was um, um, mentoring and exposing our young people to people who are in the field. I have a middle school, or two middle schoolers actually right now, and it's hard for them to conceptualize what's out there for them. We need to bring them real world experiences, hands-on learning. We need to bring professionals into the classroom and to our schools and partner with, that was a great suggestion, AAUW, American uh, Association of University Women. Um, and give them role models and, and what, what does a woman in my field look like and what does she do on a daily basis. And I'm going to start with the second part of your question about why it's important to our country. When you're looking at um, statistics that say something like 75% of our engineering jobs in this country are outsourced, that to me is a national security issue. And um, if we can do two things at once, which is fix that and give jobs to um, you know, up this number of 27% of women employed in engineering, science, and technology, and increase the jobs that we're giving to our own citizens here in the United States, that's, you know, that's a win-win situation overall. 
Um, so I would say more mentoring, a lot more partnerships with our local business in terms of bringing professionals in, and then a partnership with our schools and our parents. I know, and I know you have uh, a teacher or somebody in your college or your high school, middle school, junior high career, that's where it was for me, who said, you're good at this. And I'm, I, I know you don't know what this is, but you're going to come to lunch every Tuesday, which is when this club meets, because you have a special talent. And then helping parents identify that talent for their students. A lot of times parents send their kids, they're really not sure what's going on during the day. And there needs to be a lot more communication. I would love it if a, a teacher would be able to say to me, these are the top strengths of your student. And I would encourage them to do X, Y, Z. Um, and to make sure that we have the same opportunities in every school um, across the county. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about you know, a parent saying, wow, that's what you're doing at your school. I wish my school were doing that as well. We need to have equal opportunity across the county. Thank you. Thank you. Katie? One of the joys about going last is that everybody steal, steals your ideas. <laughs> but what I think that says is that all of us up here have a very, very passionate interest in education and making sure that all of our students, regardless of their sex, get the kind of education we want them to get, to put them in competition on a global level. That's one of, I definitely agree with Joy, if that many of our science and technology jobs are outsourced, that's a problem that's bigger than the Board of Education of Frederick County, and I think that's where we're going to have to look at that as a nation. At this time, however, I would say, and have gone to many science fairs, both the elementary, middle, and high school science fairs in Frederick County, many young women are doing amazing things in science in this county. And so it's not as if they're not, and it's not as if we don't give them opportunities or good mentorships. What I think we need to do is make sure that those young ladies, whoever they are, get plenty of publicity when they, when they manage to win a prize or go to a national contest. And they mostly, every year, almost every one of our um, uh, students who go to national competitions, there are a great many young women who do. Um, at this time, as I said, we have many that do participate. But not everybody has to have a STEM career. One of my passions is good teaching. Someone has to teach those kids. And we do need to recruit the very best people we can into teaching. I have a son who came through as an alternate certification uh, young man to a, to a math job up in Pennsylvania. I'd love to have him come here, but he didn't. Um, all that said, I think Mr. Schmelich's <coughs> suggestion about alternative certification for highly uh, accomplished young scientists, especially females, would be a great idea to pursue. Um, again, I think all students should have a chance to explore career, career options while they're in our, in our school system, beginning even as young as elementary. So the goal is to have each student find his or her passion and get the help of parents, educators, and counselors to make sure that those students find their way into a career that's going to make them happy for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, <clears throat> bullying of students has once again received national attention <coughs> in an incident right here in Frederick County at Brunswick High School. What steps do you think the Board of Education should take to deal most effectively with this important issue facing our children? What I brought with you, what brought with me today was a copy of the Board of Education policy con con you know, concerning bullying and harassment and intimidation. And I'm just going to read you a, a short piece of it because we do have a policy in place to handle this problem. I think we need to pay attention to how we handle it and make sure that it's consistent across our county, through all of our schools, and all of our classrooms. The Board of Education of Frederick County prohibits bullying, harassment, or intimidation of any person on school property or at school-sponsored functions or by the use of electronic technology at a public school or affecting the school setting. That means we have a zero-tolerance policy for this in our school system. So I, I believe it remains to us as a board and to us as a citizen, as a community of citizens, to be sure that this is something we do in our homes, we do in our schools, we do in our scout troops, we do in our youth groups, and we do in various other places in our community where people get together. I'm very impressed with the fact that the, that the Board of County Commissioners uses on their letterhead character counts. Character does count, and in this school system, Character counts as a very strong influence on our young people. I hope to see this 
emphasized more now than the other kinds of bad news we've had in the last week. Thank okay, you. so let me just interject something. So the question actually was, what steps do you think, and I appreciate you stating the policy, but what steps do you think the B Board of Education should take to deal with it when it occurs? Well, the policy is in place. So we now have um, a lot of attention being paid to it. Uh, I know our guidance counselors were overburdened in all of our schools. They have they have caseloads of up to 400 more than more and more students. But it is it, I believe it does have to happen at home, and it has to happen as I said in the community. People have to be sure that their students, their young people, have good examples and have strong influence from their home and their and their school. I, okay, I think I don't have any more specific yeah, than that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I, I also agree it starts in the home and I think part of the problem is um, is when you go on our website I am very adept at going through this county's website I've, I've been a parent advocate for for many years now and I, I know where all the information is sometimes information is very hard to find on those websites and if you're a parent coming to it for the very first time it, it's pretty challenging um, so uh, and and as a PTA uh, person um, I hear all over the county there's a clamoring on the part of parents for information on bullying, um, um, the internet, and how to keep their students safe. And that tells me that we are missing, we're edu I think we're doing a great job of educating our students as to what bullying is, what the role of the bystander is, how to report, um, but we're missing that education of parents and bringing parents in. Um, information needs to be much more accessible to parents, um, easier to find. And then instead of talking about how to keep your kids safe on the internet, parents really need guidelines. I myself struggle with how much computer time should you have? What kind of website should you go to? You have a Facebook account? Or, or even what's appropriate to post? What are the kinds of things, you know, those are the discussions that we as a school system can use as an education tool. That's an opportunity for our schools to talk to kids and, and that's also a social skill. You know, we're, we're communicating so much electronically. Email is, is so prevalent. And there's etiquette to email. Um, and a lot of bullying happens in cyberspace. So it's that parent involvement. It's reaching out to parents and, and that middle level that I think we're missing between um, our local schools, students, um, the board and administration. We have to have that parent level a little strengthened. Um, and then to look at our, we have a lot of prevention programs in place. I know we do, uh, I wouldn't call it an audit, but I think we need to do an audit um, and make sure our, our instances going down. We've had a rollout of, to our middle schools of an anti-bullying program now for the last year. Uh, how is that going and, and how, what, are, what are the benefits of that? Thank you. As the father of 11 children, I can assure you I know just a little bit about discipline. <laughs> um, with seven boys and four girls. You know, we have a zero tolerance policy, but we need to give it some teeth. I think we need to have, um, it would be nice, and what I'd like to see is the policy written so that the children know the consequences. If you do A, you get X. It's, it's too easy right now to say you have a zero tolerance policy if you don't follow through with it. If administrators aren't out there backing the teachers up, then it's wrong. I shadowed a teacher recently um, this past spring um, and witnessed students just outright being rude and disrespectful to the teachers. And the teachers really had nothing that they could do about it, it seemed. And I think that's wrong. I think there needs to be consequences for your actions, and that's part of the problem. We as a society have always said, well, my child can do no wrong. I've got 11. Let me tell you, they can do wrong. So to that end, I'd like to create a board that would be made up of, say, teachers, parents, the administration, and put together something along a list of offenses and then what you would be punished with after that. I think it would go a long way to know that you have consequences, not to just say that there's a zero tolerance policy. We really need to do something to give it teeth. Thank you. Yes. So, I, to prepare for running for the board, I decided I would substitute teach in school. And I especially chose middle school. I always considered middle school to be the most critical time in a child's life when their physiology is changing and they don't know the limits. And one of the things I noticed in the hallways in school was a lack of discipline. 
this incredible amount of noise, pushing and shoving. But what was interesting to me was that this bullying evolves gradually. It, from simple pushing and shoving, it gets to bullying level. Both my kids, I found out much later, were bullied on the buses and in the school. So we need to nip this at early stage. Once the bullying occurs in this case, then it's a little too late. So we need to enforce discipline at much lower, earlier level. School board has good policy in place, I think. But how well it's implemented in all schools is essential. There are two types of bullying, as Joy pointed out. <coughs> a physical bullying and internet bullying. This is a new phenomenon. The second one, school cannot control. It's the parental job. And I think parents should monitor and there are mechanisms available to what their kids are doing on the internet, what kind of bullying goes on, and we know there are some sad stories what internet bullying has done, including suicide of a young lady. And But the children, when they do this, they are not aware of consequences, and that's because a lot of our school policies do not entail consequences. For example, if you don't do well in a subject or don't do well in academically, you still get promoted. So you're teaching children right from the beginning there are no consequences to your failure or to your action. And I think we should involve issue of consequences in all aspects of our learning processes. Because these, these are very young people. They do not extrapolate the impact of their actions. To them, it's just a fun and games. Thank you. I tend to think that we have gotten to a place where we are trying to clinically diagnose bullying. And I think we're heading in the wrong direction. I've been to some of the school-sponsored anti-bullying programs where a person who's sponsored to be there explains about the reports that we've done and the studies and that how a bully's brain is different and how their responses to activity is different and that's what causes bullying. It was not terribly peaceful when I was growing up going to school. I don't think anybody who works with young people thinks that it's always, you know, roses and wine, you know. What I do think is that um, I've been in all of our schools, almost all of our schools, I've been in all of our high schools. There was a period in time where the philosophy was we need to let our adolescents navigate difficult relationships. The teachers and staff don't respond to activity that's pushing the boundaries. And we let them figure out the consequences. We shortly thereafter had this anti-bullying endeavor because kids have gotten out of control. So it shouldn't be surprising that kids have gotten out of control. We stopped paying attention. They're pushing the boundaries. The adult's job is to set the boundary and hold it firm. Mm -hmm. I have three children. They're three very different children. The recent news story, I can tell you my children have experienced, other children we know have experienced, because we then took the philosophy of the anti-bullying where two children are in an altercation. We identify one is the bad guy, one is the good guy. The bad guy gets punished and the good guy is rewarded. So if, if the one who has struck out is the one who has been tormented and tormented and tormented and then reacts, they are then punished for the reaction and the, and the true bully is sort of rewarded for their behavior. I believe that we can do much better mm -hmm. for our children we have actually taken large strides in trying to reinforce positive behavior from the middle school level. We need to take this opportunity to really lock down behavior at the high school. There is decorum that is acceptable in school, just like the workplace. We all know how to behave ourselves, and there are consequences if we don't. Our children know that, too. The consequences have to be swift, predictable, and consistent so that it's the same for every child. We now have the state legislature trying to tell us that they're going to limit, tie our hands in what we can and can't discipline because we've been inconsistent. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so the third question for the candidates for Board of Education is there are currently two charter schools in Frederick County. Here in the state of Maryland, the school districts are allowed to issue okay. charters. As an extension of the public school education system, what is your position on charter schools? And we'll start with Dr. Bengali. So, in principle, I'm not opposed to charter schools. 
sometimes charter school may serve a good purpose. But when we look at the charter school issue, uh, we should distinguish between charter schools in large cities with failing school system and, and the need for charter school in our county where we have an outstanding school system and outstanding teachers. Uh, we have limited resources, national resources, and right now currently we're going through economic crisis. So how we spend our dollars becomes more crucial. The charter school therefore should be examined very carefully in Frederick County. Do they add to our current school system? And would they bring in something which is deficient? That's, I would like to examine, and to me it's a theoretical question. If I were a board member, I would like to look at the charter school proposal critically and see what need it fulfills that is not available. Now, one issue that has been raised is choice. As a scientist, I have a problem with the word choice because choice could be ad infinitum. You can come up with any kind of choice. I want to have a Latin school. I want to have a Spanish school, and so on and so forth. Do we have resources or do we want to deplete the resources from our school system to establish a new charter school? So I would examine each issue and my scientific approach before making decision. So I'm not against it, but I would like to examine each charter school proposal critically. And I'm sure the current board members have been looking at the charter school, and I've, I've, I know most of them, and they have looked to great wisdom and critically, and they make decision. But I, it's a theoretical question for me right now. Thank you. Okay, Colleen. I am a proponent of charter schools and of ch school choice in general. Um, I grew up in a time when we had neighborhood schools and the elementary schools and primary schools were relatively small schools nestled in the neighborhoods where our parents actually knew all of my teachers and the administrators at the school. Over time, for efficiency's sake, we have made larger schools. Some of our elementary schools now have about a thousand students in them. Education is not one size fits all, and there are students who just can't function in an environment so big, maybe aren't doing as well. Charter schools have served across the country as a revisit to that neighborhood school, where parents and school leaders work together to make the best environment for that child, for those children, and, and make it work. Charter schools, by law, are required to have a unique educational offering. So that's what the state law says. I have heard many times where, on, on the other side of the table, people will say, charters are fine for failing inner city schools, but not out here in the suburbs. Well, charters are not made to remediate schools that we have failed. Charter schools are made to give educational opportunities to the children who exist in that region. So I am in favor of educational opportunities. Further, I'd really like to see us, we have some schools that have overcrowding problems. I would really like to see us have open enrollment at all of our schools. If you have a child who's at a school and it doesn't quite fit, all of our schools have sort of a unique rhythm, have sort of a unique you know, setup of their own. And if your child's not succeeding in one, but you know that a few miles down the road there's another that might be a better fit, why can we not? enroll them there why can we not have that choice that's not a bad thing and in my mind it actually provides to make sure that we can find success for all of our students not put them somewhere let them flail around and hope that somehow they find their way thank you Tony Schmelick I make no apologies for um, I ran for the board um, because I support charter schools and uh, I don't think we want to wait for failure the fact is, charter schools have a lot to offer, not just in the educational side, but also on the taxpaying side. In Frederick County, we fund charter schools at 68% of what they're supposed to be funded to at 98% according to state law. The, local, the current board argues that the other 30% is used up in administration, transportation, and things like that. I think they're stretching the numbers, but we wouldn't know because they won't open the books for us to see. That's the first thing. As far as that school choice is concerned, what about a school of dance and theaters, Latin, Spanish? What about that opportunity to send your child where that they will, they will absolutely have the opportunity to excel at what they do best? Why do we have to wait for them to go to college? 
Why can't we start them out at a younger age and say, hey, you excel at this. I bet you there's 400 kids out there in this county somewhere that are great musicians, great at theater, and that's just an example. There's so many different opportunities. As Dr. Bengali said, infinite. What a better way to teach our children. Along the same line, I bring homeschooling into that. Currently in Frederick County, there's 2,600 homeschooled children in the county. That is saving us $30 million in maintenance of effort. If you enrolled 2,600 children back into schools tomorrow, you know you would need $200 million of infrastructure. It's just another choice, no different than charter schools. So to that end, why aren't we letting homeschoolers then also take advantage of it, at least the high school level, when most homeschoolers go back into the system because parents don't feel that they can teach their kids at the other upper levels, specifically usually science or math. Why don't we let these kids take opportunities there to just take one or two classes in our high schools and then that would also help alleviate some of the overcrowding. So I think there's a lot of positive arguments for charter schools. They do need to be looked at critically and I will say this, that as a proponent of, home, of the charter school movement here in Frederick County, I have told them that I would hold their feet to the fire to operate at that 68% because they have to prove that they can do it cheaper and better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a really big issue and, and too much to cover in two minutes. I, I just want to explain something about the 68% it costs for, for charter schools. Um, I don't, and, and the reason that that debate troubles me is because our children, all of them are funded at around a ratio, and it's basically what it costs per year to, to fund the school system divided by our enrollment. And we do take a little off at the charter school level for administration because we'd be double booking that number. However, I don't want to go down the slippery slope of saying your kid costs $6,000 to educate and your kid costs $50,000 to educate. There are some kids in this county that because of their special needs cost upwards of 250,000 kids to, to educate per year. And I don't want to get into a situation where we're talking about what does it cost for your kid to be educated versus my kid. We are a public school system and we will educate every kid. I do believe there is a valuable role for charters in our county, and I'm not going to talk about the model of failing schools because we don't have that. I like to focus on the model that charters offer unique opportunities for students who aren't being reached at their traditional school. And the whole system can benefit from that because, first of all, you're reaching that student. Second of all, there might be some great ideas that aren't at a traditional school that a charter is using that we can use across the board. However, uh, they are not cost neutral, and if you, you know, I mean, it's just common sense. If you're talking about starting a new program for two, three hundred, four hundred kids, you're going to have to staff it. There's instructional materials that are different. So yes, it will be a cost. Um, there is benefit to it, absolutely, but because we're in such a, a, a budgetary bind, we're going to have to really weigh what investments we make over the next several years and make sure that we're hitting as many kids as possible. And I would really prefer if we put a lot more effort into focusing on every single student and bringing every single student what they need in order to reach the next level for that particular student, no matter what, they're, what level that they're operating at instructionally. Thank you, Joy. I agree with Joy. I think, we've, I think to go down the, the pathway where we start talking about how much a child is costing is probably the wrong way to go. In fact, it's definitely the wrong way to go. Um, Mr. Schmelich knows that, uh, that there are many opportunities in the school system for students to come out of homeschooling and go into a public school to get a fine, uh, maybe the last two years of their education before they go off to college. Mr. Schmelich knows that well. But I would say that I'm extremely proud of the fact that Frederick County has the first charter school in the state of Maryland. In fact, it was a successful program before the laws were even written. And when the laws were beginning to be written in the legislature of Maryland, they called Frederick County to come to, to Annapolis to work on that legislation. So much of what is there in the legislation in Maryland for charter schools has come from the experience that we gave it in Frederick County. So I'd like to say that I'm very proud of the Monocacy Valley Montessori Public Charter School. It's been a success. It continues right now to this day to be a success. And we have a second Montessori school that just opened this fall. And I have to take, I t tell you, I am very, very proud of those two schools. They've shown us that, that an innovative, creative program can really work for charter. And I'm, I'm in favor of that. However, we have many good choices in our school system across the system. 
that, that even in elementary we have art and music. We have wonderful art and music opportunities for students in elementary, middle, and high school. So to, to say that we don't have choices, that's not true. We do have choices and we have good programs that children can choose from and their parents can, can, can guide them towards. Um, so I support charter schools as long as they do not have a negative impact on the resources that we need for the current programs or students in our school system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well done. So we've now answered the three questions. Each of you will be given one minute to close to share whatever you want to say relating to the questions or about your past experience or whatnot. So one minute and uh, Ms. Kusumano, if you would please. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you folks here today. And I thank the uh, League of Women for inviting us here to, uh, to talk about the issues. I just wanted no, to tell me, let me just correction. I'm sorry. Commission for women. <laughs> Commission for women. Um, I thank you guys for having us thank here. Um, I just wanted to touch on the budget a little bit and we have been in difficult economic times in the last few years. The school system is in an economic crisis of its own making. We have never cut the education budget. It has grown every single year. We have reallocated money out of the classroom into building administrative buildings, remodeling other administrative buildings, modernizing heating and air conditioning systems in other administrative buildings. Um, the list goes on and on, and we've lost sight of our children. I will say when the new superintendent came the last budget cycle, she made clear that if teachers were to get salary increases, they would be coming from the classroom. And I think we need a different answer. We can certainly find a different answer. I am digging, have been digging. I've been involved for years in lobbying efforts for our Board of Education. I hope to serve our kids, our communities, and our schools if you will vote for me on the Board of Education. I'm Colleen Cusimano. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Bengali. Well, once again, uh, thank you very much for the Commission for Women for writing this forum. I have educational background, I'll be at a different level, but I was a professor and chairman of a department. And so I have a certain idea of what education is all about. And I look at the current education, and Frederick County, has, as I said earlier, is an excellent education system. But during my experience in school, substitute teaching, I found no matter what you do, about 10 to 15 percent of the kids fall off the cliff. And right now they go for service sector jobs. I'm a long-term planner. That was my job at NIH and at, at the Shriners Hospital of Children where I was the Vice President of Research. And when I look at our education policy, currently we are taking steps to solve the current crisis <coughs> that everyone is aware of. And I'm glad everyone is involved in it. But I also see a long-term crisis coming as technology advances very rapidly. And I worry about what would happen to this 15 to 20 percent of kids who follow the cliff by because by a kid entering, say, kindergarten this year will be in job market in 2030 and will not have service sector jobs available. Are we preparing them to go on welfare or are we preparing them to get becoming tax paying citizens? Thank you. Tony Schmelik. I'd also like to thank the Commission on Women also for this opportunity. Um, I would just like to also say that the, those were great questions that were asked today, um, but the financial situation of our school systems really needs to be looked at also. A um, couple of questions that weren't asked that the commission had sent to us all was one, you know, how are you going to, any ideas that you have to solve uh, the, the financial problems that they're going to be coming down the pipe to our current system. You know, one of the things that happened, I'll just use as a quick example, uh, as a quick example, um, the superintendent did a budget neutral reorganization of the administration hired a person uh, of a director, but then fired a level lower paid positions. I was still trying to figure out how you can replace one person, 11 people with one person, remain budget neutral. And I don't think the board's asking the tough questions. We need a line item uh, budget given to the board members, and we need to tear it apart page by page, line by line. And they need to publish their checkbook online every quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Joy Schaefer. Hi, I've had um, years of professional experience before I had my three children in education. 
um, working with teachers and educators all the way from the high school level, all the way up through colleges, community colleges, lifelong learning, all the way up to institutes for learning and retirement. It's given me a breadth and depth of knowledge um, on education issues. And I've had a long history of working in our local public schools, starting at the bottom with my own uh, child, my firstborn, when he went into kindergarten in 2004 as a classroom volunteer, taking on more and more uh, responsibility at PTA, and now working at the county council level and working on things like the elementary math task force in 2011, which recommended the two primary textbooks we're now using in math classes at the elementary level, as well as um, school improvement teams and serving on the family uh, school partnership committee. I have an extreme commitment to public education. Um, we are preparing our children for our, you know, crossing the stage and being prepared to be successful at college and career. And some of those careers we don't even know about yet because they haven't been created. We want to make sure that they're fully prepared, that we're using our tax dollars responsibly in order to do that, and that we're marshalling all the resources in our community to get them there. Thank you. Katie Grove. Well, I had a two-minute speech prepared, so I want to see if I can pare it down. <laughs> For me, kids come first. We must continue to place student achievement at the top of our list of priorities. We should promote high achievement for all students, no matter what their circumstances <coughs> might be. We must develop good character skills as we build academic and career skills. I support doing what it takes to make those things happen. Folks, we are really under siege by the current events. We right now are facing the possibility of sequestration, which could, could cause a $1.3 million cut to our local budget. I could outline and had prepared for that question. I had some, some specific answers, but I won't go into that here. But this stands to be a very serious threat. And if we are getting the kind of thing from Washington, D.C. that we seem to be getting, more mandates and less help financially, we are in trouble, and I think we do as a community, and that's what you said to our folks. You are our community. We need your support, and we need you to come out and vote, and I appreciate your support on November the 6th. Okay, well, thank you. I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you.